This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 3, Section 2, Units of Measurement. In this section, you're going to list SI units. You're going to distinguish between mass and weight, and you're going to be able to convert between, between the two temperature scales of Celsius and Kelvin. Are we there yet? You may have asked this question during a long road trip with family or friends. To find out how much farther you have to go, you can read the road signs that list destinations and their distances. In the sign here, however, the distances are listed as numbers with no units attached. So is Carrieton 44 kilometers or 44 miles away? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, 44 kilometers is 27 miles. So there's going to be a big difference if we're 44 kilometers away or 44 miles away. So again, without units, you cannot be sure. When you make a measurement, you must, 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 must always assign the correct units to the numerical value because without these units it's impossible to communicate the measurement clearly to others so we've talked about that many times in science it's not just a number it is a number with a unit and I want to remind you that the unit always 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 comes after the number so you always need a number and unit pause the video fill in the blanks and then play to hear my words so why is it SI units instead of IS units? Well, because it came from the French, les systèmes international units. Of course, I'm not saying it as nicely as the French would say it very smoothly. Um, so the French came up with the system, so that's why it's called SI. Advantages is that it's used worldwide and everybody understands it except of course for us, which is the disadvantage. You're learning it now in high school instead of learning it when you were a baby. Um, but the other advantage is that it's, it's easy to manipulate because it's multiples of 10, easy to convert and move that decimal. So these are the SI base units. So I want you to pause and fill in the chart. I believe there's one strip left over because you're going to fill that out in a few slides. So I want you to, first of all, understand that these are considered SI base units. These are not the base units that I talk about when we want to convert from uh, like a millimeter to a meter, right? And the base unit is that unit without a prefix. These are considered the SI base units. So if you haven't noticed, mass, mass's SI base unit does have a prefix kilogram right the kilo so you might want to star that or highlight that but when we ask for an SI base unit for mass it's the kilogram but when I'm talking about just converting between a, a base unit and another unit then that's going to be a unit without a prefix I thought this was strange but true you might want to pause and read this over I kind of said some of that so on here on the bottom, this is what's really neat. If you take the distance between the pole and the Earth uh, equator, I'm sorry, the North Pole and the uh, equator, and you chop it up into 10 million pieces, one of those 10 million pieces is considered a meter. And I believe to this day, it's still that measurement. So let's talk about these units of different um, things that we're going to measure. One thing we might measure is distance, so that's length. And how do we do that? Well, we do it by using a ruler. So let's practice on estimating that last digit. Remember, in laboratories, we're not just going to measure what we see. We want to estimate that last digit. So how many numbers mean something? In other words, when we measure something, we can and do always estimate between the smallest marks. So if we look at this ruler, we have a four and a five. So you're not gonna just tell me that this is four centimeters. You have to go above and beyond and give me that four point something. So I'm gonna say this is either gonna be 4.5 or 4.6. Remember I talked about I will accept a range. I don't want both numbers, you, your eyes, have to tell me, are your eyes seeing that 4.5 or the 4.6? However, the more marks, the better we can estimate, right? So scientists always understand that, again, that last number measured is actually an estimated number. So now this is a, the same green line, but a different ruler. The ruler now has many more marks on them. So now between the 4 and the 5, we have 10 marks. So Pause, see if you can come up with a value that you would give this. 
Now, I apologize, I did not include the centimeters, right, because that always needs a, but we're really just dealing with that estimating of that last number. So now, you should have been able to figure out that that green line was between the 4.5 and the 4.6. So I would, uh, again, I would accept any one of these three numbers, but I still only want one. Anytime you make a measurement, you have to estimate that last digit, uh, but I only need one of them. All right, so again, um, measurements we write down will tell us about the ruler that we're using. So again, estimate that last digit, and what do you come up with? That's what I came up with. So again, any one of those would probably work. If you did a little bit, if you did like 142.5, that's a little much, right? So you again, you want to kind of break up, um, you want to break up the, the, the distances between that 141 and 142 in some way. All right, how about this one? Hopefully you came up with one of those. And this ruler, this one's a little tricky because there's no decimal here at all, right? You're estimating between that uh, 140 and the 150 and you're, they're not, uh, uh, there's no decimal at all. Okay, so hopefully that was a little fun too. All right, so how about volume? So first I'm going to talk about liquids and we're going to use a graduated cylinder to measure the volume of liquids. And again, that's what we're going to use most often in lab. However, if you have to measure a solid, you're going to have to measure its length and its width and its height, okay? So you're going to have to measure all three of those according to that rectangular object, multiply them, and that's why you get a unit like cubic centimeters. And we're going to talk about that as well. So again, let's practice. We did this in lab, so pause. Remember that you're reading the bottom of the meniscus. Can you come up with a value? Hopefully you came up with, again, one of those. I don't need all three as a range. I just need the uh, one of those to tell me what your eyes see. How about this one? Hopefully that makes sense. And last one? Hopefully you got one of those. All right, so for volume, again, when we're measuring liquids, it's going to be in milliliters using the graduated cylinder. When we're measuring solids, it's going to be in cubic centimeters or centimeters cubed. I've heard it say both ways. And this is going to be really important to know. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, cubic centimeters and going to liters, so let's say, for instance, I tell you to convert five cubic centimeters to liters. Well, I don't like to deal with those cubic things. I don't like to deal with cubic anything. Um, so they they made life a lot easier by saying, okay, well, one cubic centimeters is really one milliliters. So anytime they give us values in cubes, I try to relate it right to the milliliters or centiliters or deciliters or liters, okay? So um, I don't like to be dealing with those cube things. So that's a really important, you might, again, want to star or highlight that. It's going to be real useful later on. So here are some examples of volume. You can pause and read and look at the pretty pictures. Pause, pause, and see if you can come up with an answer here. How many cubic centimeters are in two liters? Again, I would have changed the, um, I would have, I went from liters to milliliters because I know that conversion pretty well. Um, and then I know, well, milliliters equals cubic centimeters. So I did my conversion. I crossed out my liters. I uh, knew that one, the liter was bigger, so that gets the one. I didn't deal with the cubic. I just quickly converted it to milliliters. And then you can convert it back if you need to. All right, units of mass, again, how much matter something has, but it's very, very different than weight. And I have a couple slides that explains that as well. And of course, our standard mass is the one kilogram. So pause and look this over to give you some ideas of masses. So what is weight versus mass? Again, pause and read this over. So pause and read this over. So pause, 
This talks about an astronaut's weight is really one-sixth as much as the Earth, okay? So in other words, you weigh six more times on Earth than you do uh, on the Moon. Okay, however, how does the mass compare from the Moon to the Earth? So let me put this into perspective. If you have a hundred atoms in your body on Earth, now you go to the Moon, do you still have a hundred atoms in your body? Absolutely. So that's why we always talk about mass and chemistry because mass always stays the same. If I have a hundred atoms in my body here, I'm going to have a hundred atoms in my body no matter where I go. So weight is just based off of gravity and that's why we quote unquote weigh more on earth than on the moon because of the gravitational pull. All right, so how about energy? Energy really deals with heat energy in chemistry, okay? So heat energy is always going from a warmer object to a colder object. Now, remember I talked about that uh, chart, right? Go back to that SI base units chart and make sure to put in that the joule is the base SI unit for energy. So let's talk about this warmer, cooler object. So think about your nice cold glass of iced lemonade in the summer. So there's a big misconception there. Most people think that the ice is cooling off the liquid and making it cold for us to, dr to drink a nice refreshing drink. However, it's really the warm water is warming the ice to cause it to melt. And what's happening is as the ice is melting, right, as the ice is melting, it is mixing with that warm water and now the temperatures are becoming the same. So the warm water is really melting the ice cubes, the colder ice cubes, uh, and then at some point those, the temperatures are, are going to, to be the same. Again, this is another important conversion. We're going to be dealing with specific heat, something called specific heat when we get to the uh, uh, later on in the in the year. Um, and the specific heat of water is 4.184. So this is a real important number to know and we're going to be using later. So I just thought you knew what the calorie was, right? The non-SI unit for energy is calorie. So you're like, oh yeah, I ate this, um, you know, piece of pizza and it's so many calories. Well, really the food calorie is actually a kilocalorie. So think about that one. So here's your units of temperature. Temperature is just how cold or hot something is. There's two temperature scales that we're going to be dealing with. Again, the, the degree Celsius and the Kelvin. And the Kelvin does not have a degree symbol, okay? And again, you guys know everything is Fahrenheit, but that's really not SI. Nobody else in the world uses Fahrenheit except for us. Why? I don't know. So these are some cool thermometers. Again, pause, read, and look at the pretty pictures. Pause and pause. This one's a cool one because it's based off of uh, density. Okay, so here are some values you should know. Freezing point, boiling point, and what's called absolute zero. And absolute zero is still theoretical. They've come a few degrees close to absolute zero, um, but they haven't reached it just quite yet. Um, not that, that I know of to my knowledge. Um, and absolute zero would mean that everything just stops. You know how in solids, those particles of solids are still vibrating a little bit, right? There's still a little bit of motion in there. There's still a little bit of kinetic energy. Um, not as much as the liquid and definitely, definitely nowhere near the gas, right? Uh, as far as movements. Um, but supposedly if something reaches absolute zero, the molecules and atoms would even stop moving. So here are some other interesting values that you would think may be interested. We talk about room temperature a lot. So that's going to be 25 degrees Celsius, something to keep in mind. And I just thought this was kind of different. So here are our temperature formulas. When we're going, uh, when we need to solve for Kelvin, we're going to take our degree Celsius temperature and add 273. So how are we going to get degree Celsius? We're going to subtract from our Kelvin. So this is comparing the Celsius and Kelvin. And I want to remind you that Kelvin can never be negative, okay? Kelvin actually starts um, at, at, the, at the zero mark, basically. It can never be in the negative. Like, you can have negative degree Celsius. You cannot have negative Kelvin. Um, and the divisions are the same. There's 100 divisions. The, the divisions are the same. Um, they're just dealing with larger numbers in the Kelvin unit. So what do you remember? Quickie quiz here. 
So can you come up with an answer? Hopefully you came up with that one. And how about here? Again, you might want to pause. Hopefully you came up with that. And number three, look at that um, equation that we just gave you. Can you convert? All right, hopefully you got that. All right, we will see you in class uh, to do some book work and hopefully get some of these uh, units better understanding.